Hi, everyone. Tonight, we are going to talk about harvest celebrations, which are the origins of the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, so a little bit more of a complete Thanksgiving holiday history, some facts that you might or might not know, a little bit more detail than I was familiar with. And then we are going to talk about Thanksgiving food traditions then and now. So harvest celebrations have been common throughout history, um, in ancient times up until the present. Romans celebrated an autumn harvest festival that honored their goddess of corn. Greeks had a festival that honored their goddess of grain. Um, in the Jewish religion, there is a holiday Sukkot, which is in the fall and also is a harvest celebration. In Africa, there have always been harvest festivals like Mowo festival in Ghana or the Yam festival um, in West Africa in late August. And there's even um, some indication that Bali, way back when in ancient India, was uh, originally celebrated by farmers for a harvest festival. Uh, the Chinese also have Harvest Moon Festival or the Mid-Autumn Festival. And I'm sure there are others that you know of. So harvest celebrations were pretty common throughout history, as I said. And the settlers, uh, colonists, came to Plymouth, uh, brought with them a legacy of religious observances they called Thanksgivings. They often took place around harvest time. These events included days of prayers of thanks, and they in also included prayers of thanks for abundant harvests, which were necessary for them to survive for the winter months. And of course, the Native American indigenous people who have lived in North America for over 12,000 years have always celebrated harvest with ceremonies of thanks. The idea of giving thanks is central to Native American culture. I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the traditional tribal lands of the Nanticoke Lenai, Lenai Lenape tribal nation, part of the Delaware Confederacy. And local names um, of many areas and streets around uh, the library might be familiar to you um, are from their language. Portopec, Navasink, Rumson, Matawan, Manasquan, Ganassi, Wanamasa, they all came from the uh, Nilanape tribe. In addition, I just want to um, add to the Native American celebration, it always included an expression of thanks for the land and nature and to honor the land. And Native Americans also believe you should give without expecting anything in return. So at how it all began, um, you all know 101 or so English settlers left Plymouth, England in September, 1620. Um, they weren't all pilgrims. They were, some of them were other religious sects seeking freedom and the pilgrims actually called them strangers if they weren't part of their group. And they included merchants, craftsmen, field workers, indentured servants, several young orphans, people uh, looking for a new adventure and families who were looking to seek a better economic situation. So it was more than just the pilgrims. Um, so they arrived at Cape Cod in December and actually they originally were going to uh, settle or look for a place just to, to start a settlement in the Hudson River but they apparently could not navigate the river, the waterways, so they went Cape Cod, and they were aware of, of all of, of the, uh, probably about a lot of uh, places on the East Coast to, they could uh, har get a har harbor, find a harbor and um, down anchor and, and create a settlement because there were traders and explorers who were, um, sailing up and down the East Coast, trading with the Native Americans. So this wasn't a, an unfamiliar territory to Europeans. There also was Jamestown in Virginia. So in any event, they found after looking at several different locations in Cape Cod, they chose the location of an abandoned Patuxet village, Patuxet village, part of the Wampanoag Confederacy, settle in a place that they called New Plymouth. 
Um, it was abandoned because most of the inhabitants had died from diseases they caught from European traders. And I think most of us have been aware of the fact that uh, all indigenous peoples in the new world, quote unquote, the new world, who, who encountered Europeans had no immunity to the diseases they brought. And, and quite often were wholesale uh, epidemics and a lot of people died. And that's what happened with the Patuxent village. There, most people, there was an epidemic and most people died and those that uh, remained went to live in another village because there just weren't enough people to sustain life in that village. So first winter was very difficult for the settlers and I don't remember whether I knew that or not, but they had a really hard time of it. They arrived in December. They didn't have good shelter and didn't know how to build shelter didn't have much food to eat except what was on the Mayflower. They had brought uh, plants and, 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 and crops, but they did not know how to plant them. They weren't appropriate for the climate. And it was December, so there was no planting that was going to happen. Most of them chose to stay on the Mayflower since, as I said, they couldn't uh, build good shelter. And many people actually became sick and died that first winter. It was not successful. In the spring, the Mayflower left and went to England and some hardy souls stayed behind. And they were lucky enough to, um, to have to encounter a Native American whose name was Squanto. Squanto as, was a member of the Wampanoag tribe. And he was sent there by the chief of the Wampanoag Confederacy, Massasoit, who uh, had heard about pilgrims and wanted to know more about them. And Guanto actually used to live in the village, the Patuxent village before he was kidnapped and taken to England where he learned to speak and was of course very surprised to come back and find that it had been abandoned. Now it's actually a little bit more complicated in, in that he was kidnapped and taken to England where he learned to speak. Um, at some point, well, first he went to England, he stayed there for a certain amount of time, he was sold as a slave. He learned to speak English, he managed to escape, and I'm a little bit confused about what happened next. He might or might not have gotten recaptured and been sent to a mission in Spain that helped him get home, but eventually what happened is he was able to get on a ship hired by, hired by a Captain Burmer who was going back to um, North America, and he was hired as an interpreter. Now, during one of their trips up and down the East Coast, ship was attacked by the Wampanoag and Squanto was actually taken captive by the Wampanoag tribe. And it's confusing to me because he was, his, his tribe, the Patuxet, were a member of the Wampanoag Confederacy. And the only guess, I can only guess that they probably, because he lived so long in, in England and spoke fluent English and had been working for this Captain Dermer, that they just didn't trust him. So initially what happened when Squanto spoke well, English well, interacted with them, he taught them what they needed to survive. Uh, they didn't know have knowledge or skills to grow local plants for food. They didn't know how to hunt the local wildlife or fish for the, um, the, the wildlife in, in the uh, ocean waters. They didn't know how to build shelter from what was available. It was something that was very difficult for them uh, to know without being trained. And he taught them how to hunt turkeys and how to fish lobster clams and other shellfish. He taught them how to grow corn, beans, wild rice, and squash. And actually corn, beans, and squash are um, create a growing trio uh, called the Three Sisters. And they are very symbiotic because the squash is a ground plant keeps the ground moist and prevents erosion. The corn grows up into a tall stalk, which the bean vine can grow around as it, as it grows up. And also the roots of the bean uh, put nitrogen back in the soil. So it's a very symbiotic um, threesome and it, it's a big part of crops that were grown in that area. Um, he also taught them how to cook the meals that um, from the corn, the beans, the squash, the rice, the things that they normally cook. And 
He also helped them to build, show them how to build shelter from corn stalks and other uh, materials that were available to them in that area. Let's see. So in the fall of 1621, uh, they had a very good harvest that would, with Squanto's help, and that would assure their survival through the winter. Now, in gratitude, they had a three-day celebration uh, or festival of thanks. Now, as I said, Massasoit, as we mentioned, was the chief of the Wampanoag tribe. And as I I don't remember, no, if I mentioned that he, that they, he, his tribe or confederacy covered parts of the coastal region of present-day Massachusetts and Rhode Island. But in any event, his aim in sending Squanto and his aim in general in making contact with the pilgrims living, uh, living in Plymouth was to possibly forge a mutual peace agreement. And he was interested in that because he, he had he abs actually lost a lot of his power and influence in the area, his diminished status in the region, owing to the loss of significant numbers of his people to disease. And also the rise of a rival uh, confederacy, the Narragansett, whom he now had to pay tribute. So he hoped by his alliance with the pilgrims, he could regain his former power. So the three day festival that took place sometime between September or November, I'm not quite sure whether the, um, in thanks that the pilgrims or the settlers invited um, Chief Massasoit, or he took it upon himself to join them because he wanted to have this alliance with them. And he brought along with him 90 tribe members and their families celebrate the harvest. And of course, this was a little bit more <laughs> than the pilgrims were quite ready for, but everybody sort of jumped in and helped hunt and cook and harvest uh, vegetables and other food for the um, festival and also did the cooking and things like that. So the three-day feast, as I said, took place between September and November. And out of the celebration, a 50-year treaty was signed between the Plymouth settlers and Massasoit and the Wampanoag. While the treaty between the Wampanoags and the original settlers did remain in place for 50 years, more and more settlers came needing more and more land, grow food and live. They did that by settling on and using lands that Native Americans in the area had lived and used for more than 12,000 years. And they often forged alliances with other Native American uh, confederacies. So as they continued to grab all this land and ended up mistreating a lot of Native Americans and it es that escalated and so did tensions between the Plymouth Colony uh, coalition and coalition of other tribes and the new settlers coalition with other tribes and due to a confluence of factors and, uh, and broken treaties, there was a major disruption of Native American villages. It ended in a war and they were scattered, the Native Americans were scattered uh, and their native lands were, were taken, uh, that the settlers took ownership of. Um, of course, they were pushed off land they had lived on for 12,000 years. So for this reason, reason, Native Americans do not look at Thanksgiving as a celebration, more of a reminder of the time that they lost control of their land and were scattered to different locations. Taking a light turn and going in a different direction then, we're gonna talk about how Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving holiday developed in this country. So in the beginning, there was no set time of year. Uh, there were many different harvest celebrations in the fall of each year amongst different villages and in different areas, uh, but they were not connected in any way. And they took place whenever harvest was finished for that particular place or whenever they would normally have a harvest celebration or a Thanksgiving celebration and pray uh, and, and have a Thanksgiving celebration of thanks. In the fall of 1789, George Washington created a day of Thanksgiving as a celebration of winning the Revolutionary War. But that was a one-time event and it didn't really catch on. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but I'm assuming it was around the same time in the fall during the harvest. However, in 1863, President Abraham Lincoln made the fourth Thursday of every month, of every November, I'm sorry, a national holiday of Thanksgiving. And he had actually hoped with the country divided by the Civil War, the holiday would bring people together. 
And that's how we came to celebrate Thanksgiving on the fourth Thursday of November. Now, Thanksgiving food then was very different from what we eat or mostly different from what we eat now. Um, what they ate at the first Thanksgiving feast were, were traditional foods, mostly of the Native Americans, not so much of the, of the settlers and colonists. And they probably had wild turkey and other wild birds and deer and other hoofstock. Um, they also fished cod, eel, shellfish, like lobsters, which are plentiful on Cape Cod, as everybody knows. They also had many dishes made from corn, which the Native Americans taught settlers because this was a very big part of their food ways. And since corn was a very plentiful and easy to grow crop, it was something that the settlers learned to depend on. They also had vegetables such as cabbage, onions, squash, and beans. We talked about the uh, squash and beans and the corn being a three sisters uh, agricultural trio grown together. Now, sugar was in very short supply. I know part of our Thanksgiving celebration or desserts, but sugar was in very short supply because it had to be brought in from the Caribbean and that required ships going back and forth, the Caribbean from Europe and then from the Caribbean to the uh, North America. It was, it was an arduous journey and it was a, it, a long journey and it was pretty it, costly to do this. So while they had sugar, it, it did not have it in abundance. So things like sweet pies and desserts would only be served to honor guests. But sweet sauces like cranberry sauce would not have been on the menu, uh, nor would mashed potatoes for that matter. It had not been invented yet. Basically, people ate whole food that came out of the ground. They ate it pretty much how it was harvested with some cooking. Um, Pretty much what is recommended these days to eat whole food, a uh, whole plant-based food diet, which is very healthy. So Thanksgiving food now is has evolved into something very different. And every family has its own special traditions at Thanksgiving. Turkey, I think, is a, a mainstay in most households, but not necessarily all. Stuffing and gravy have become a symbol of Thanksgiving also. Ham is also served in many homes. Um, and as I'm gonna discuss in the next slide, you know, there are variances people bring into the Thanksgiving uh, celebration, foods that they have, uh, cultural foods that have been passed down to them, uh, heir, uh, heirloom recipes that have been passed down to him, uh, cultural food ways that have been brought to this country by their ancestors. We also then get, of course, to the sweet potato pie versus pumpkin pie discussion. Of course, neither one of those existed at the time of the original Thanksgiving. And though apple pie and pecan pie might be on the menu as well, we all know that there's a constant uh, back and forth about which is better, sweet potato pie or pumpkin pie. And I know your family, I'm sure, has its favorite. So let's not forget mashed potatoes and mashed sweet potatoes and cranberry sauce, which over the years have come to be part of a traditional Thanksgiving dinner. In some African-American homes, they might include mac and cheese, collard greens and cornbread. Uh, in Hispanic homes, they might also serve tamales and may stuff their turkeys with more traditional uh, Hispanic uh, proteins like beef chorizo, which is a sausage, bacon and to pork. And with newer a group of immigrants that are coming in from Southeast Asia and from further down in Central and South America. I'm sure they also bring food waste traditions, even though they might not celebrate a Thanksgiving holiday. If they do celebrate it in this country, they were probably gonna add their own food waste traditions and their own traditional foods into the celebration, which makes it a very interesting uh, meal. So here's a timeline for some of the more typical Thanksgiving dishes some of us may enjoy. So in 1621, of course, that was a turkey, most likely one of the fowl and fish that were hunted and eaten at the first Thanksgiving Harvest Festival, and something that has remained over the last um, several hundred years as a mainstay in, in most Thanksgiving celebrations. Now, stuffing was actually around for quite a long time. Also, it's been around for quite a while. While there might or might not have been some kind of dressing, because as you know, stuffing is also called dressing, some kind of dressing used by the Mayflower settlers. First time stuffing is mentioned as part of a Thanksgiving meal is in the latter part of the 18th century. And then we come to the um, discussion and the 
uh, contest between pumpkin pies and sweet potato pies or mashed sweet potato with a marshmallow crust. Uh, some people make a sweet potato pie with marshmallows, some people make a casserole, but anyway, in actually the pumpkin pie has been around for quite a while. It was began to be part of the Thanksgiving celebration in 1796. The first mention of this pie is in an early American cookbook. However, apparently it made its debut in an English cookbook in 1675. So it wasn't totally new, but I imagine that the pumpkin from 167, the pumpkin pie from 1675 was quite different than the pumpkin pie in 1796. Um, my recollection of studying some of the old English food ways was that they basically, a pie to them was they took two pieces, two, two crusts, threw some stuff in the middle and cooked it. So whether it was a savory or a sweet dish, whether with a seasoning at all, how it was made, uh, I, I wasn't able to find specifics about that, but I'm sure that the pumpkin pie that everybody ate in 1796 was a lot tastier. And of course, by that time, they had more access to sugar. And then sweet potato pie or mashed sweet potato pie with marshmallow crust didn't start until 1917. I mean, people might have used um, mashed potatoes or sweet mashed sweet potatoes and pies before that. But the real entry of the sweet potato pie with marshmallows on top or the casserole of mashed sweet potatoes with a marshmallow crust started really into the scene in 1917. Uh, it actually made its debut in a recipe for this dish, which was actually created by a company that made marshmallows right around the time that they were first produced in this country. And that sort of makes sense because you're introducing something new and you certainly want people to uh, use it and buy it. And better way than to supply them with recipes for delicious dishes that could be made with marshmallows. So that's what they did. So cranberry sauce. Cranberry sauce is a much later um, entry. There probably would have been cranberries and they might or might not have cooked them. I'm not sure about that. The actual idea of cranberry sauce pre-made was first offered to consumers in North America in 1912 in Hanson, Massachusetts. Um, there were bogs, there were cranberry bogs in Hanson, Massachusetts, which makes sense. And also, interestingly, ocean spray was first started by this by using these bogs in Hanson, and it actually remained headquarters uh, in Hanson. It remained its headquarters from sorry remained in Hanson before moving to Plymouth. Interestingly enough, in September 1977. The reason we 1941 is because that was when the widespread ability in the form of canned cranberry sauce sauce appeared on the market. Um, this also allowed the product to be sold nationwide and year round, but it became more ubiquitous and uh, included in most traditional Thanksgiving meals. And then in 1955, along came green bean casserole, which is a mainstay for a lot of homes during Thanksgiving. This recipe was created by a home economist working for Campbell Soup Company. Again, I believe it was a cream of mushroom soup that was the base for that. And again, Campbell Soup Company would include recipes sometimes on the label of their soups to encourage people to buy them and make meals out of them. So it's not surprising that the green bean casserole came on the uh, scene and apparently was, was used quite a bit during Thanksgiving dinners. So whatever delicious Thanksgiving food traditions you have in your family, please enjoy your holiday. Whether you are congregating with family, with friends or a community congregate site or helping out, helping serve meals to people that are less fortunate or even just hang out with friends or hang out at home doing your own thing. We hope you enjoy whatever delicious Thanksgiving food you decide to eat and have a really great holiday. Thanks so much and see you next time.